So please open your mind and your heart to Prerna Balasandara. You're in, are you currently in school? Yes, I am just about finishing my master's. I finish um, this semester, so I graduate in May, and I am gonna get. I'm gonna graduate with a master's in international affairs. Yeah, what is? What, I mean, what is that exactly? It's so funny that you asked that because in DC, it's like every other person has a degree in international affairs. So okay. that question's actually really refreshing. <laughs> um, it's it's really interdisciplinary, and I think that's one of the reasons that it was like pretty easy to transition into doing research about um, genital integri- integrity because um, it just has to do with tons of different topics in international affairs. You can kind of focus more on politics. Um, you can focus on um, socio cultural issues, policy issues. Um, that are wide ranging and international. It's it's just it's such um, a mishmash of different things that it's like kind of hard to explain it as one specific major. Um, part of me wonders if I've gotten such a general degree that I have no practical experience in anything. <laughs> that is definitely a concern of mine. But um, but it was a really really great master's, and you get a lot of great like regional specific um, like. Uh, Fo- like um academic focus too so sure yeah. so do you have any specific um hopes or vision for mm-hmm. what what you want to do um i would say that it's changed over the course of my master's so for the first year and a half i was just focusing on international law in reg- regards to refugee rights um and um gender rights. And I think once I started getting more into bioethics and genital integrity, it kind of transitioned into more of like children's rights in various cultural settings. So um, in my undergrad, I learned a lot about um, FGC, female genital cutting. And Mm -hmm. um, the way that it was taught was um, specifically focusing on the cultural reasons for why it's done. So it's really easy to transition into learning about um, uh, male g- genital cutting practices, such as routine infant um, male circumcision, because that's America's version of a cultural practice that's taking place um, that has um, both medical and cultural implications. So in terms of like a long-term goal, I think it's going to take a little bit more time to really refine that because so much has happened in the past two years in terms of like different interests that have come up. Um, so so I'm not 100% sure, but I'm not too worried because um, thankfully there's plenty of time to figure out exactly what I want to do. But I'm really interested in research and children's rights um, and hope to kind of stay in those areas. Yeah, well, I'm sure if you're following your interests and, you know, your passions, you'll mm-hmm. you'll figure it out naturally, I'm sure. Yeah. But yeah, yeah I, I notice how um, I like how you say, uh, refer to it as you know, genital cutting and genital integrity. It's something Mm -hmm. I've noticed about people in the community that are kind of researching Mm -hmm. this stuff is like, Mm -hmm. just the way we talk about um, this Mm -hmm. stuff sort of defines how we think of it. And like, just referring to somebody as being uncircumcised, Mm -hmm. you're right away, your world is defined by circumcision being a normal thing. Absolutely. And even the term circumcision just sort of takes away the humanity of it and like mm-hmm. the reality of, you know, cutting genitals and mm-hmm. like genital integrity being like, yeah, that's how you were born. You know, it's not. Exactly. Yeah. So I appreciate that for sure. And it's something mm-hmm. that I'm recognizing about myself, even, yeah, you know, yeah. I've been passionate about this stuff and uh, I myself am not circumcised. And it's, mm-hmm. it's just something that like, even I just, I find myself saying it and I'm uh, yeah. you know, referring to somebody as non-circumcised or circumcised. Or uncircumcised, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And it's just like kind of blowing my mind. Um, yeah. So before we get too much into that, I want to know mm-hmm. um, what kind of got you started getting into this stuff? Mm-hmm. It's kind of crazy because it was just the most random night ever. Um, and some people don't even believe me when I say this, but I think this <laughs> is how a lot of like, 
real true like passion spark so it was just one night where the question just kind of like popped up in my head I was like wait I have no idea what circumcision actually entails mm. because kind of like you said when I was in high school and college um, everyone just kind of like write circumcision off as such a normal thing and that's one of the things that I really focus on um, kind of uncovering the the reality behind circumcision and uncovering that normalcy that people have placed on it. So um so anyway, so I was like, okay, I have no idea what this actually entails. So I literally just Googled what is circumcision. <laughs> and um one of the first sites that popped up was Doctors Opposing Circumcision site, mm-hmm. um, where they have really, really great resources and materials. And as I started reading through all of their articles and getting really deeply into it, I was transfixed. I was kind of caught in this feeling that how can this exist? How can there be a hospital down my street where circumcisions could be taking place right now? And parents might not have ever been on the site before, might never have even considered it because if the father is circumcised, and a lot of studies show that one of the major indicators for um, or the determinants for whether or not a parent will choose to have their child circumcised is if the father or male figures in the family are circumcised. So if parents are walking to the hospital thinking, oh yeah, my like male partner, be it husband or boyfriend is circumcised, there's no point for me to even research this because this is what I'm going to do. Um, and I was thinking, think about those parents and more importantly, those infants, those minors that are experiencing this right now in the hospital down my street. And I remember like wanting to like leave the house that night, like walk to the hospital and go to the maternity ward and say like, what do you guys like? Mm. What do you guys think about this? What are you doing? But it really just started with that one night and I was completely transfixed and I've always been really passionate about children's rights. And I, um, and I think that areas that aren't talked about much are the ones that we should be talking about a lot. So that's why I kind of just devoted all my, um, all my additional time apart from my master's to really focus on this. So that is the story behind it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. For me, um, you know, it's kind of, it's, definitely a, a personal thing and it's been much more just like intuitive and personal than it has been any type of like grand awakening or research mm, okay it's just like you know as a kid it's something that I was um like kind of embarrassed about because mm-hmm. uh you know I uh had my foreskin and it's like you know, you see kids in the bathroom or whatever, and my parents mm-hmm. talked to me about it, but it still was just like, I don't know, it was just weird. And kids would, yeah, make, yeah. Kids would make fun of it uh, mm. grow, uh, growing up over the years, not necessarily make fun of me, but just like, mm-hmm. you know, you hear yeah, like the turtle yeah. head or yeah. the anteater yeah. and all this stuff. Yeah. And so I just had the, a little bit of a complex about it. And then, mm. um, but that sort of faded, but then it as I became like in my later teen years, it was sort of like mm-hmm. um, the next level of it, which was like, I wonder what girls will think, you know? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then um, I quickly realized that as I started to have girlfriends and stuff, like they didn't even uh, understand what it was or, oh, or yes. know anything about it. Yeah. And so that's when my yeah. mind started to become really blown and sort of like, huh? Like, what? I was so worried about this and they don't even know. So yeah, like, yeah. do people really understand this? Yeah. And then I sort of didn't really think about it and just like, I came to really appreciate it and was glad mm-hmm. that I, I, I didn't, didn't get circumcised and all of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a, a couple months ago, um, a super close friend of mine who got really into it for a while um, mm-hmm. sent me Ryan McAllister's video, uh, mm-hmm. The Elephant in the Hospital. And yeah. then I was just like totally uh, blown away, you know. Mm-hmm. Because I just I always knew that I felt like it it mm-hmm. was, it wasn't right, um, mm-hmm. unnecessary at best, and maybe even mm-hmm. more. And then when I saw that, yeah, I was really like, okay, this <laughs> I cannot believe oh, we're gosh. still doing this. Like it just uh- blows my mind. Um, and so. Um, You know, you you brought up the the female genital cutting, mm-hmm. and so that is that still currently banned in the United States. So interesting turn of events. It was banned in 1996. Um, all forms of female genital cutting, and um, I have done more research specifically in that as well because um, I took a few public health classes. 
uh, in the past two semesters. And again, public health programs mostly just focus on female genital cutting because that's the other that that's the the othering of this whole genital cutting mm. topic where it's not common here in the U.S. So we can study it as this cultural p- practice that's done far away and we can kind of analyze it as an outsider. So uh, when I was researching female genital cutting, I learned more about the various different types. And um, uh, I'm not sure if you re- you've researched this closely, but just for the sake of no. giving a quick summary, um, there are four types. Um, and this is very general because there are variations on each different type. But type one um, basically involves uh, removal of the labia. And it can be the it's typically the labia minora. Type two has to do with removal of the labia and the clitoris. Mm. Type three is infibulation, which is the one that is often talked about because that is the most invasive. And that in fact, in, um, actually has to do with um, sewing up the vaginal opening, um, as well as potential removal of other sexual organs as well. And finally, type four is kind of called miscellaneous, which is kind of silly in a way, but um, it's it's the other types of cutting in terms of just nicking mm. or pricking or um, uh, just smaller cutting gestures. All of them awful in their own way, though I am hesitant to put too many labels on it because one of the really important things about looking at this topic at all is that people who do this, parents who choose to do this, um, are not do not think that they're doing anything awful or horrible. They're really just participating in something that they think is normal. So the important thing is really just getting a wider conversation out there um, about these things, but not to go on a completely different tangent. So back to your question, all types of FGC uh, were banned in 1996. Very interestingly, uh, in the past couple of years, there was a case in, um, I believe it was Michigan, uh, and you might have heard about this, where a doctor was caught for performing, um, was caught performing type 4 FGC on minors. Mm. And it became this whole uh, case. And ultimately, last November, a federal judge ruled that it was unconstitutional for Congress to deem FGC illegal because um, and it was kind of like um, uh, it was it was a case of conflict between states rights and federal rights. Um, And he ultimately said it's actually up to states to decide whether FGC should be illegal or not. And in most states, FGC is is banned, but it's not it's no longer um, a federal Ban. But in terms of like the timeline of legality, I don't want to um, 100% say exactly what's going on because I'm not 100% sure if it's like now completely illegal sure. or it's only based on states. But that is the ruling that was passed in November, which is pretty significant. Yeah. Uh, and it certainly has implications because the FGC that um, doctor was perform- performing was actually less invasive than oh, infant male circumcision. Wow. Yeah, um, and this doctor could have potentially faced years in prison for doing um, something that's actually far less invasive than many doctors in this country do every day. And was that part of the reason they kind of backtracked a little bit to sort of, because they didn't want to, like, the implications of, you know, full-on making that illegal Mm -hmm. and putting somebody in jail for it makes it look pretty Mm -hmm. bad that male circumcision is happening on a Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. daily basis. You know, in that regard, um, I believe that that was part of the defendant's um, argument. But ultimately, the federal judge ruled on um, a technicality where it uh, Congress was making an in- interstate regulation when um, when this this per- when Congress is supposed to only make laws um, regarding commerce. So this is really a technicality. Okay. Um, but I do believe that part of the defendant's argument is that what this doctor did was less invasive than infant male circumcision. Okay. Something you said earlier, um, I think is really important. It's really hard to like, I like what you said about, you know, not being careful about, I don't know exactly what you said, but basically not judging Mm -hmm. other cultures or people for doing, because people are just trying to do what they think is best. And that's something I realized right away is like, I don't want to go around proselytizing about this because Mm -hmm. most people just like they did what they thought was normal or right and I have 
many friends that are circumcised and parents that had circumcised their kids. And it's like, yeah. the last thing I want to do is make somebody feel like terrible about what they've done. Um, because like they said, like you said, they're just on mo- going on momentum or whatever. Um, so I think that's really important. And yeah. Um, and, and to what you're so sorry to no. interrupt you, to what you're saying uh, right here, I think that's really important, but I think it's also important to remember that there are, uh, there are people you can talk to. So um, I typically try not to share this information with parents who have children who are grown and who probably aren't having any more children anytime soon, because to be honest, that boat has kind of sailed in that regard. The key people to talk to at this time um, are my friends and friends in the healthcare, um, in healthcare professions that uh, will either work with infants or they are their friends that might have children soon. Mm-hmm. I think that demographic is key. And in terms of getting this information out there in various groups, educational groups that do this, those are the ages they are trying to reach. Because I think that's an age where we aren't trying to preach to them. And that's really, really important because um, as actually Ryan McAllister was telling me, he said, people's minds are never changed when you throw facts to them. It's oftentimes just raising questions to kind of examine their own beliefs that yes. really cause people to think, wait, what am I doing or what am I choosing for my child? Um, so, yeah. So even though you just said people's minds aren't changed by facts, I would like you to share some facts. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one of those things is just kind of like, you know, I know some of this stuff. I recently watched a couple documentaries, whatever. <laughs> I wanted to inform myself more. But a reason why I wanted to have you on and do this in the mm-hmm. first place is just to share this information with anybody else who might run across this podcast mm-hmm. or whatever. And because mm-hmm. um, it's something that's important to me. And um, so how did kind of circumcision start and how did mm-hmm. it evolve from what it started as to what it is now? Yes, uh, it's a really, really interesting story. And um, the approach that I take is a chronological approach that I hopefully will make sense for listeners and to you. And please let me know if you have any questions and mm-hmm. definitely stop me um, if you'd like me to pause and explain something. Sure. So um, so the story begins in the late 1800s. So this was during the Victorian era. So one of the first questions I ask people to consider is, do, do you think that circumcision was um, part of modern medicine, mainstream, not mainstream, part of culture and society non-religiously for a very long time? And a lot of people aren't sure of the answer. I certainly had no idea of the answer before I started doing research. And the answer that, to that is no. It was it only entered American um, and English medicine in the late 1800s. So that's actually quite recent. It's only about 100 and 100 and. 50 years ago or so. Because before, before that, it was yeah. just a religious, religious starting exactly. in Judaism. Exactly. Mm. And um, uh, um, one of the aspects of my research, too, is to see how it's interpreted in different religions. And um, uh, in some of my research, I found that evidence suggests that the type of circumcision that is performed um, in the in the bris today, the Jewish circumcision mm. uh, ritual, is actually different is potentially different than the one practiced dur- during Abrahamic times. Um, and I can go into more of that later, but uh, for now, let's just stick with the, sure. with the um, <laughs> medical story. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so in the late 1800s, there was this fear of sexuality, a fear of masturbation, and um, this was pre-germ theory. So there was this belief of um, these diseases caused by Uh, reflexes, and it was called reflex neurosis. So the thought was an illness, but neurosis is caused by reflex. So children who were caught masturbating, they thought that um, if this child also had a corresponding disease, such as epilepsy, or um, any sort of mental disease or anything, they thought that masturbation was the reason that this child had this disease. And the only way to cure masturbation was to circumcise. And believe it or not, um, they actually thought it was part of the punishment as well. So they used to hold the child down and they, um, John Kellogg, the creator of Kellogg cereal, mm-hmm. you might know this. Um, he, uh, in his book, plain facts for the old and young, he actually says that 
make sure you don't use anesthetic for these uh, young boys because the pain from the circumcision is part of the punishment so they'll remember not to masturbate. Absolutely ridiculous. So this is, this is actually what was going on. Um, and for the next 50 to 70 years in, in England, Canada, Australia, America, you know, the English speaking countries, this belief continued that, um, that somehow circumcision would cure illnesses. Now, fast forward to the 1940s or so. Scientific reasoning and research had come to a point where they realized, um, researchers realized there was no actual robust scientific evidence that supported circumcision as a surgery for any sort of illness. So for this reason, in England, in Canada, and in Australia, um, circumcision was dropped off health insurance coverage. And in those countries, it's universal health insurance. So it was dropped off universal health insurance. Mm. So the rates decreased rapidly. So that is why today, and this I also didn't know, in all of those countries, including South America and non-Muslim Asia, the rates of circumcision are as low as 5 to 25%, which wow. is in stark contrast to the U.S., which is a little bit above 50%. And that was, it was much higher 20 years ago. Sure. At 80, 90 percent. Um, so, OK, so now we're in the 1950s. And it, one of the first arguments made in the U.S., because let's remember the U.S. did not um, remove circumcision as a surgery, um, a preventative surgery for infants in hospital. Mm -hmm. So the doctors were continuing to offer it as a surgery for children. So. Um, one of the first arguments that researchers made in the U.S. to support this was the idea that um, smegma was a carcinogenic and it would cause penile cancer. A couple of really important things to note here. So to this day, no studies actually prove this association between um, uh, having foreskin um, smegma and penile cancer. That associate, that's a strong association has never been made. And a more recent study from Denmark actually says that tobacco use and hygiene practices play a far stronger role in, in, uh, in determining whether or not um, a male will have penile cancer. And more importantly, in both Europe and the U.S., the rate of the likelihood of having penile cancer is one in 100,000. And compare that to breast cancer in this country, which is one in five or as much as one in four today. And no one is mm -hmm. talking about removing the breast tissue no. from infant girl or a toddler girl, even though that could have potentially a greater um, uh, um, safety for that female in the future. Exactly. But again, this goes back to the idea of bodily autonomy and bodily integrity and giving that child however many years to decide when they're an adult whether or not they want to have this surgery. Mm -hmm. Um, and just moving on in 19, so that was the first justification for continuing the surgery. Um, so now we move on to uh, the 1980s. In 1986, uh, a man named Thomas Wiswell released a study which said, uh, published this, Wiswell, <laughs> I can't believe it. Can't I can't make it up. It there. <laughs> um, he published a study that um, posited that circumcised boys are less likely to um, uh, get UTIs below six months of age. One of the major flaws in this study, and it's really unfortunate that this flaw hasn't been um, more greatly uh, publicized because it has extreme significance. So one of his flaws was in his study was that he actually created a confounding variable. And this particular variable was he was asking mothers to forcibly retract their infant son's foreskin um, prematurely. And what forcible retraction does is that it causes micro-tearing um, between the foreskin and the glands, which creates multiple sites for infection, thereby increasing the likelihood of getting a UTI. And uh, just a quick note about forcible retraction. So um, infant males' foreskins are non-retractable until childhood when over time, until puberty, they increase in retractability. So by the time um, a child or a male is in middle to late puberty, their foreskin is fully retractile. But especially during infancy, it is essential to not forcibly retract 
the foreskin because it's it can actually cause like connected kind of, isn't it? At first, absolutely, it's connected. It's connected at birth by something called a balano prepetual lamina, which is similar to what connects your fingernail to your um, mm. to your finger. So it's a it's a pretty significant membrane that connects the two um, the two parts, and it's important too because it actually plays a protective function during infancy. Um, and when it's not forcibly retracted, it actually protects the urethra from, um, from you know, waste in the diaper and any um, outside contaminants. Sure. So it plays a really important role in infancy. And then finally, the most recent studies that we've heard of that kind of try to justify um, infant male circumcision are the RCTs from the early 2000s where uh, three studies were conducted um, so RCTs, randomized control trials, were conducted sure. in Africa um, that said that um, circumcision uh, increased the um, – if, if a male was circumcised, they, the relative risk reduction of um, getting HIV was 60%. Um, and this number, 60%, was, um, I don't know if you remember it back then, but it was kind of all over news articles, and they were like, wow, this is it. You know, this is going to change the game. But They called it like a they, vaccine? Yeah, almost. called it like a vaccine. And vaccines typically have a much higher relative risk reduction than um, 60%. Mm-hmm. What those studies also glossed, glossed over is the absolute risk reduction from circumcision, which was 1.3%. And they also glossed over the fact that um, these particular studies had to do with female to male HIV transmission, while in the US and most developed countries, um, HIV is far and away transmitted from male to male sexual um, intercourse. Mm. So this study was not only inapplicable to many cases of HIV, in most cases of HIV in this country, they were 100% inapplicable to infants. Right. And yet, the, the American Academy of Pediatrics used this as part of their reasoning to continue the, um, the opportunity for parents to um, have their child circumcised. But it's important to know they're never, they're never pushing a parent to do so. They're just saying that if you would like to do, say, do so, there are potential benefits, which is part of this mask of confusion that parents have, I'm right. sure. And aren't they typically asking them, like, kind of right away, sometimes maybe the uh, mother is not in a, you know, most clear frame of yep. mind, yep. potentially on uh, still on having the effect of pain drugs Absolutely. that she was given, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, um, there was a case, and it was actually discussed in the American Circumcision documentary, um, which I believe you checked out, and I highly recommend yes. it, uh, where where a mother was um, was given the stack of informed consent forms um, right after a C-section, I believe. And, of course, she was on pain meds, and still just her mind was kind of getting over this pretty significant surgery. And she actually did end up signing the form that consented to having her child circumcised. And um, they took it to court, and I believe they were able to settle um, with the hospital. But it goes to show that she is not the only case. She's the one that took it to court, but many parents are handed that stack. And um, they're kind of asked to make this decision at that point in time when they really haven't had a chance to um, really consider it. And doctors are certainly not... um, or many doctors are not discussing the reality behind this surgery, which I may add could be because they have been taught this in a specific way as well. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's an interesting question. How much of it is um, they don't provide the information and how much mm-hmm. of it is they just don't know it? Mm-hmm. You know, is it pretty common yeah. for nurses and doctors to not really know the, the facts about about circumcision? I think it's actually quite common. I haven't done specific studies about this, and this is part of my future goals, but from even just informal studies of all the um, healthcare professionals in my um, in my Facebook friends, and just sending this question out to them of how much do they know about circumcision, and I ask them like a few different things about it, and many of them say in their textbooks, um, it still says Uh, circumcision is um, a surgery that uh, could help prevent UTIs, um, STIs, HIV, and penile cancer. And um, the textbook doesn't really mention the foreskin. In fact, um, Brian Earp, who is um, 
uh, amazing scholar in genital autonomy, did a presentation about um, about this topic, and he said he got the leading textbook on reproductive health, and he got the e-copy, and he, you know, control, it, control F and looked for foreskin, was not mentioned once. Wow. Uh, he searched for Propuse, which is the um, the scientific term for foreskin, and only one uh, item popped up, and it was the female foreskin. Mm. So, if doctors are not even learning the value of this organ, uh, they are not thinking about the fact that the removal of this organ is actually a harm. And this is a great point that Brian made, um, and it's one that really got me thinking as well. In American medicine. The foreskin has essentially been given a zero value. So when doctors talk to parents about whether or not they want their child to be circumcised, there is no real discussion of it being a harm because this organ has zero value. So its removal still is uh, still is at zero. There is right. no negative effect. However, if you give this organ a positive value, as in you learn its form, you learn its function, you learn its value in infancy and in adulthood, um, then you give this organ a positive value. Then, once you know that, and this is what's lacking in American medical education, and a lot of researchers have um, found this, uh, when you give this organ a positive value, then its removal creates a harm, an yes. unnecessary harm. And that's where the uh, issue, the bioethic issues are at stake. That's perfectly said. <laughs> um, so... You basically segued for me into what I wanted to talk about next, but I wanted to comment quickly on the um, the reasonings because even I, you know, I've I've seen a lot of the problems with some of these studies, but like you bring up with the uh, UTIs or with yeah. sorry with the uh, um, the penile cancer versus the yeah. breast cancer and not removing um, you know breasts. Uh, it's just even if these studies were very legit. <laughs> And the mm -hmm. reasons were clear. It's still like it's most of these things aren't going to happen to an infant or like a UTI. Yeah, if it is going to ha happen to an infant, it's treatable just like absolutely. any other infection, an ear infection yep. or whatever. Mm -hmm. We don't and, and it's cut far babies. More likely, it's far more likely. It's five times more likely uh, for a female to have a UTI in her life than a male. It, a male has a less than one percent likelihood. Right. Uh, so like you said, in females, we do not, um, or American medicine does not propose permanent genital alteration to fix the problem. They always, um, they always recommend you, um, antibiotics or change of diet, you know, very right. minimal. Yeah. Uh, strategy. Yeah. And we don't go, we don't even consider the idea of modifying or removing any other body part from an infant to prevent Absolutely. some potential future Absolutely. issue. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. just, it doesn't make any sense when you really start to think about it. It's just, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance. And so that, I, I think that stuff is really important. But so what you started to go into, um, which I think is the logical next step here, is like, what is mm -hmm. the value of the of the foreskin? Mm -hmm. And beyond just the, you, you touched on the um, importance for the infant and the uh, mm -hmm. protection, mm -hmm. but uh, what about the other benefits of the foreskin? <clears throat> so when the um, when a male enters adulthood um, and actually puberty, the foreskin takes on an erogenous role. And um, I'm going to be pretty specific about this because mm -hmm. um, a lot of people argue uh, how there there is no. Um, erogenous implications of having a foreskin. So I will touch on that in just a little bit. Uh, so uh, what I mean by an erogenous role. So the foreskin has um, very specific neuroreceptors. So it has FNE. So FNEs are free nerve endings, and they are um, uh, neuroreceptors that have to do with deep pressure and pain. But the foreskin, um, the glands, the head also has this particular neuroreceptor. Mm -hmm. Now, the foreskin has two other um, neuroreceptors called Meissner cor corpuscles and Pacinian corpuscles. And those are just technical terms for fine touch neuroreceptors. So I really like doing this little um, example. So it's a demonstration. So for you and for any listeners in the future, mm -hmm. if you just take your hand and um, you just rub your fingers against the top of your hand, 
Mm-hmm. So not your palm, okay. the other part. Yep. So just like rub it very normally. And it doesn't really feel like anything in particular. Mm-mm. But turn your hand over to your palm and fingers. And now gently rub your fingers against that area. Mm-hmm. Very different sensation because your fingers and your palm have uh, these Meisner and Ficinian corpuscles, which are fine touch neuroreceptors. So the foreskin is the only part of the penis that has those neuroreceptors. So when you remove it, you completely remove a part of the sexual experience that cannot be replicated um, in a circumcised penis. The reason I say it like this is because sexual experiences vary so widely. And I am sure you have heard, I'm sure many listeners have heard um, examples of circumcised males who say, oh, it's so much better this way. And then intact, uncircumcised, I'm going to say intact because mm-hmm. yeah. I kind of believe that word. Intact males who say it's so much better this way. The reason I'm not saying that one is better than the other is because the sexual experience is so subjective. Yeah. What I will say is that the foreskin has no, fine touch neuroreceptors that are found nowhere on the circumcised penis, thereby eliminating a whole sexual experience from males who do not have the foreskin. And interestingly, the only part of the circumcised penis that has these slight um, inklings of these fine touch neuroreceptors is the circumcision scar that ring around um, the penis. Mm -hmm. Um, And finally, the foreskin actually acts as a natural lubricant. So it's possible to have this smooth gliding motion of intercourse without having added lubricants, which is typically an important part of um, sexual intercourse when the male is is circumcised. So, um, so again, just highlighting the fact that it is very hard to say one sexual experience is better than the other, but um, researchers can across the board say that there is a whole sexual experience that is eliminated when the male's uh, foreskin is removed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really mind-blowing. I mean... I, I would imagine that the um, natural uh, lubrication aspect played into the whole um, mm-hmm. trying to get men to stop masturbating thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, w- I would imagine, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it is a very valuable, important part of the body, and that's not mm-hmm. to say that, um, you know, like you said, it's not better or worse necessarily because everybody has their own experiences. Exactly. But there are a lot of men, which is kind of crazy, that are trying to regrow and yes, I think yes. having success. Yes. Yeah, foreskin restoration is an absolute um, area for people to look into more who are circumcised and um, want to know if there are options for them. Um, and uh, many of the sites online that I send to you have links to um, check them out more. But um, but if you look up foreskin restoration, you'll find that there are actually different ways, um, which basically involve uh, using tools, manual tools that uh, essentially create a foreskin out of the skin that's there. And it takes quite a while because you have to kind of loosen the skin there and kind of almost like grow additional skin. Mm -hmm. But um, as American Circumcision, the documentary says, uh, for some men who've really struggled, um, especially because circumcision causes keratinization, which is desensitization of the glands, um, which can potentially cause... um, sexual dysfunction in some males not all not suggesting all by any means but um this foreskin restoration can definitely be an option Mm -hmm. for circumcised males who are kind of uh, who want to know if there is something different out there better out there um, and just want to know more sure um so one of the main things that's really been blowing my mind about all of this and it I get pretty far out there with with all of my thinking and my ideas, so <laughs> forgive me for that. But it's the just the regardless of any of any of the um, stuff about the medical reasonings or <laughs> the uh, importance of the foreskin or any of that. It's just simply the 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 traumatic incident to in, to the infant males in our country. <laughs> And Absolutely. what potentially even the cultural impacts of that might be. And you see so much um, talk and emphasis on um, 
on feminism and women's rights, and I'm not trying mm-hmm. to downplay that at all by, mm-hmm. by saying this, but it's just like yeah. there seems to be a massive blind spot yeah. in that we're traumatizing like f- close to 50% of the infant males in the country. Mm-hmm. And um, I think there is even some evidence to show like the brain changes or more intense responses <laughs> to pain. Yep, yep, um, yeah. And so it's just like that's the part that really gets me in that like it's like this universal pain that it's we're just inflicting this yeah. trauma on the men in this country and then sort of mm-hmm. at the same time railing against toxic masculinity and I'm not trying to say that this is the number one cause of all male uh, aggression and all this stuff yeah. but at the same time it's definitely seems to be a key part of like there's violence happening against yep. infant men every day. And that's somewhere where we need to maybe start to try to like yeah. help foster more compassion and more sensitivity yeah. in the male uh, population in the country. Yeah. And I absolutely agree with you in that regard, because the, um, the trauma inflicted to infants is something I cannot ignore. And I hope more people don't ignore either. Um, And this is one of the really disturbing parts about this is because um, sometimes I get very uh, just kind of shaken Mm -hmm. um, by the fact that so many doctors are doing this, even when it's, it's um, uh, kind of down on pen and um, on paper that infants are experiencing serious pain reactions during the surgery and yet doctors are doing this but i think this is part of the normalizing of it Mm -hmm. so um so i think they're even though they might feel uncomfortable doing it i think they're told and i i actually am quite sure that they're told that this is just a surgery that you have to do um this is just a norm in this country of course the surgery is going to be painful for a child it's just that's what a surgery is but I do want to take a second here to dive a little bit deeper into the pain responses of infants because I think this is extremely important mm-hmm. to know. And um, I would definitely ask listeners to consider being the infant in this circ- uh, in this position because this is part of um, this is part of like um, kind of empathizing. So um, so in regards to the procedure, the infant is strapped into a circumstraint. And uh, it used to be both arms and legs were strapped in, but um, but now it's just legs. So um, right off the bat, this is typically causes the infant to feel a little bit distressed because um, they've gone from being inside the mother's uterus and it, in a very warm, comfortable place, and mm-hmm. now they're put in a very unnatural position. Um, and how str- how long after a, uh, after birth is this birth? typically? It can be it can be a few hours. It wow. can be a day. Yeah, a few hours. There are cases where um, a mom is, while she's she's still recovering from her C-section, her child has already been circumcised. That is unbelievable. Yeah. So in the first few hours of life, life, this can happen. Um, So the next step is that um, uh, they they clean it. But in the process of that stimulation, oftentimes the child's penis becomes erect. And um, an amazing pioneer in, in, in the start, and the kind of woman who started all of this, Marilyn Milos, um, and I'm sure you've read her work and others might have as well. Um, she said, this is potentially the first act of sexual violence that a child mm-hmm. experiences in their life. Because in the first few hours, in the first day of life, they're being stimulated in this way. Again, not implying that the doctor is trying to do anything inappropriate, right. but just from an outsider's perspective, this is what is hap- taking place. So once the child is uh, cleaned and draped, um, the next step is to uh, separate the foreskin from the glands. And during the separation stage, uh, researchers have recorded that um, some infants' heart rates jump 60 BPM. And um, it's kind of hard to imagine that as a as a person who's not in medicine and science, but basically that is a significant jump in heart rate and shows significant distress. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the foreskin separation stage, uh, the doctor uses a probe to scrape off the balana preputial lam- lamina and um, uh, separates the foreskin from the glands. Then a uh, cut is made along the foreskin. A, bell, a bell-like instrument is placed over the glands and the foreskin is kind of stretched over that. And then... The clamp portion, this is the gomco clamp. 
um, there are two other types of clamps as well, but the gomco clamp is the most used. The clamp portion is uh, kind of uh, placed over it, a little hard to explain, but um, if you would like to see, there are um, videos available online. Um, definitely important if a parent is considering this, definitely important to see this. Yes. Um, uh, so the clamp is placed over, a screw is tightened to essentially crush the foreskin and deaden the skin. And then once the foreskin is dead, a scalpel um, cuts off that skin. And I remember for probably the first few months after I learned about this, I had to force myself not to think about this because I kept telling myself, if anyone thought about being in that situation, they would not do it. But people separate themselves from what's actually yeah. going on. And they allow themselves to be comfortable with what's going on. And that's why this has gone on for so long. Um, now, these pain reactions really vary. And some parents even say, the nurse brought back my baby and he was sleeping. So as adults, infants also have variable pain responses. They have a fight or flight response, which is similar to adults. Some adults scream in pain and some become quiet and pass out yep. because our pain responses vary greatly. It's similar with infants. Uh, researchers have noted that their crying is significantly different yep. than crying about other things like a dirty diaper or they're hungry. It's a it's very different crying. Uh, there are cases of apnea after, after the circumcision where they're, um, or during where their body essentially shuts down which is their pain response, which some mistake for falling asleep, but it is not yep. um, because uh, researchers have found that the sleep that they're in is this non REM sleep, which is the unhealthy sleep. We were trying to go for REM sleep um, as, as humans. That's I've heard, I've sleep. heard that described as like a fight flight or like play dead. Like it's the third like survival technique of like, basically. That's, that's a really great point. That's a really great point. And um, it could uh, be the infant's, survival strategy to just um almost consider and this is not this isn't me not uh, i'm not trying to present a scientific argument no. here but just thinking about it um it could be the infant just trying to possibly be still enough that it might not happen or it might stop um which is which is something that adults do too i think actually 100 percent um so um so another thing that happens as well is um for the hours after the circumcision, even up to 24 hours afterwards, parents have noted increased irritability, increased wakefulness, um, and uh, issues with breastfeeding. So these are really, really significant things that happen during the circumcision surgery. Um, another thing about oxygen saturation, too, there's large fluctuations because some babies are noted as breathing very quickly. And then some actually even hold their breath because that's, again, their coping mechanism. Um, so there are noted pain responses, and the various anesthetics that are out there, DPNB, dorsal, dorsal penile nerve blocker, a ring block, e EMLA, which is a, um, a topical cream, all of these researchers have found do not completely eliminate the pain from circumcision, yeah. um, which as adults... Adults who have circumcision, uh, who have operations on their genitals, are usually put under general anesthesia. Mm. But infants, uh, especially under six months, can't go under that because of the dangers of going under general anesthesia. So, yeah. in turn, they don't give them anything at all or very little. Sure. Yeah. So the, the I mean the the evidence just stacks up and up and up, and it gets to a yes. point where it's like, how much more do you need? I mean, um, exactly. and I feel like the more evidence I get, the more it just yeah ultimately boils down to this most simple explanation which is really just like um like even if they if those things did kill all the pain still you're taking an infant away from its mother which mm -hmm. already happens a bunch in right. in hospitals and and that's yes. a whole nother topic yep. in and yep. of itself yep. but yes. the infant gets taken away to some other room with other people that it doesn't know strapped mm -hmm. down and mm -hmm. you know we i think it's easy to think of infants because they can't talk and they can't yep. do all yep. these things that they're not intelligent or something and that they don't feel things they're not conscious of things mm -hmm. i would argue and this is just me being a uh 
you know, mm-hmm. idea guy, but I would I would argue that infants are probably extremely intelligent in mm-hmm. in a like a subconscious reactive way. Uh, yeah. They have ability to sense like their mother or sense strangers, yeah. sense sense dangerous environments. They get yeah. st- strapped mm-hmm. down. And I don't know, are you familiar with Gabor Mate at all? <clears throat> I don't think I am. If not, I think you would really dig his work. I'll have to I, send you some of his stuff. But yes. he talks a lot about um, stress in utero. So like if a parent's mm-hmm. stressed, they're this much more, a baby is this much more likely to develop ADD during its lifetime. Mm-hmm. If a uh, <laughs> If the if the birth is stressful, the, he just talks about a lot of these different studies mm-hmm. regarding a lot of stress in childhood and later developing things like ADD, depression, mm-hmm. drug use. Okay. He's done a lot of work around addiction and stuff. And mm-hmm. I just find it so interesting in that context of like kind of what I already touched on, but just sort of the intense amount of trauma that it must be. And it's such a vital time in the development Absolutely. of... Yeah. The infant for the rest of its life, its brain, yeah. its ability to trust yeah. humans and trust its parents and know that it's yeah. not going to be harmed. And yeah. it's like you're just sort of violating and dominating it right from day one. And it's, yeah. I would, I'm just speculating, but it has to have yeah. brain impacts and, you know, ADD, depression, all these things are so, uh, yeah prevalent and obviously in males and females but there yeah. are if you look at there are a lot of statistics that show a lot of that stuff is higher in males um yeah and so no, and that's, and that's such a great point too about how much infants can um analyze and even remember uh, i think you were referring to the study earlier too um where a uh, researcher uh studied the pain responses of infants six months after uh, they their birth, yeah. and um, she found that females and intact males responded far less significantly than circumcised infants. So there, these circumcised infants, you think, oh, what can they think? What can they remember? What can their bodies process? What can their minds process? And this study basically showed that their minds can remember yep. things like this, and especially significant things like this. So. To what you were saying, I think there um, so much is discounted about what infants can feel and think when in reality it can have so many implications for the rest of their lives. And um, I think that's really something that we can't um, we can't overlook in today's world. Yeah, I think it's interesting because as adults, we can sort of contextualize things and, yeah. and be conscious, have this extra layer of awareness and we can think about thinking about things and all of this stuff. So for some yeah. reason we attach that with like, oh, that must be worse because we're like aware of the pain and we know, but it's like for an infant that they're just like recording, you know what I mean? Like, exactly. I, I, yeah, I don't know if how deep you've gotten into this. Uh, I don't know, like year one through seven of a child's life, they're in like Delta brain waves or something where they essentially are just recording everything into their subconscious mind. So it's like, okay. It's like, uh, yeah, exactly. Like they're just ultimately experiencing and recording. Obviously, I don't know what it's like to be an infant, but it just yeah. seems like such an impressionable uh, thing. And I, if we were to imagine circumcising an adult, that in and of itself seems like painful and intense. Exactly, and, exactly. And that's why it's <laughs> usually done under general anesthesia. And occasionally it's done under... DPNB, which is the which are the two injections, but um, men typically complain about um, the pain from just the injection. So, can you imagine infants who um, a researcher named Anand, who in the 1980s did um, research specifically on pain in infants? Because before that time, especially earlier in the 20th century, doctors and scientists believed that infants didn't feel pain at all. Yeah. And I'm sure you've come across this in your research and surgeries, major surgeries were done without any anesthesia at all, just just sedation, which is um, almost like a human rights, uh, today, a human rights um, uh, atrocity to put all these infants under these surgeries. Um, mm-hmm. It's almost like torture. But um, he did research to show that infants actually have a more significant pain response because uh, to painful stimuli, stimuli because the painful stimuli is new. Mm. Um, 
And exactly to what you were saying, they are the way that they process this is completely different because they have no frame of reference. And he argues that it actually makes the pain more significant for them. Yeah, it's like the the very first pain they'll ever experience or something, you yeah. know. So, um, a lot of parents don't seem to care as much about the medical stuff as just the cosmetic yes. sort of yes. thing, right? They want yeah. their their child to look like their parents or their their children's friends, um, and so at that point, it's essentially like a cosmetic surgery. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that's not something that we would ever accept in any other capacity. Like, if, Absolutely. if I mean, think about get... think about FGC. That's unacceptable in this country. Right. Exactly. And even if you want to get wild and take it a step further, if you imagine giving a kid a nose job when it comes, I want his nose to look more like his dad's or whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just it becomes really silly. Um, Absolutely, and I think that touches upon um, what really serious ethical, bioethical issues that are at stake. And um, a lot of people in this field, in the field of genital integrity and um, genital autonomy, really speak to three specific um, uh, ethical pillars that are at conflict in this issue. Uh, So like you were saying, if a parent brings to a doctor um, their child and says, um, you know, I want to have this particular surgery Um, done on them, the doctor has to go through this sort of checklist. So um, first of all, they have to give the parent informed consent. And one of the issues in this topic is that doctors do not give patients and parents informed consent in this particular area because the American Academy of Pediatrics, which conveys all circumcision information out to the public, does not know the reality of the risks. In fact, in their 2012 technical report, they write, and I quote, they do not know the true incidence, impact, and added costs of circumcision, meaning that they have never tracked the implications of um, circumcision over a male's lifetime. Mm. So this includes if they um, uh, remove too much of the foreskin, they might, a uh, male might have a curvature of the penis, which is um, apparently talked about yeah um, that blew my mind in uh in males Uh, another some other very serious risks are hemorrhaging infection pain is a risk bleeding is a risk and in rare cases death and brian earp recently published an article about uh factors associated with um neonatal deaths in relation to circumcision which i uh, recommend to uh to listeners and to you to check out if you haven't yet um so, so that's one issue. So p- p- um, doctors aren't giving parents informed consent. So right off the bat, um, there is a, one of their pillars of ethics are kind of um, lacking. Another one is the concept of do no harm. And it's the concept of beneficence and non-beleficence kind of combining to one. And just kind of summarizing this, uh, a doctor is, their kind of um, whole code of ethics is built on this idea that the first course of action or the, the most minimally invasive course of action should be the first course of action. Yeah. So you do not do harm, especially unnecessary harm to a patient when there is a minimally invasive course of action. So again, if a parent comes to a doctor um, in this regard, even if there were all these issues with like UTIs, penile cancer, HIV, um, STIs, in all those cases, there is a more minimally invasive course of action. Mm. So again, a doctor is a group kind of going against their whole foundation yeah. to participate in this uh, in this uh, so- socially motivated surgery. And finally, the concept of autonomy. And going back to your question itself, because this is a cosmetic surgery, essentially, um, that autonomy must be given to the individual to participate in this cosmetic surgery. So, um, you know, you might have heard about the rise of labiaplasties in the last few years with um, females wanting to reduce or change the shape of their yeah. labia. However, the however someone might feel about that, you know, they might be like, that's ridiculous. Why would you do that? Like, yeah. Why would you try to copy, say, like a porn star? Yeah, like, exactly. Why would that be your model for what you want your yeah. body to look like? 
But that still being said, as an adult female, she has the right to do that to her genitals. Yep. And she has the enemy of her body to do that. So, um, so, but in this case, in this particular social cosmetic surgery, doctors are, are okay um, removing autonomy from this patient, this infant, mm-hmm. and um, allowing the proxy consent to make a decision for something that they wouldn't allow in other cases. They wouldn't allow a parent to decide on a labioplasty for their infant child. Right. It's another hot topic, and I don't expect you to even comment on this, but it just popped into (laughs) my head. It's like, it's just, it's an interesting thing. It's just like an example of like how we can cause so much violence to somebody so innocent like it's like spanking kids or hitting kids, you know, like <laughs> you wouldn't accept going around slapping adults or mm-hmm. you don't hit your friends as an adult, mm-hmm. but yet we can hit a kid to try to teach a kid not to hit. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. kind of along those same lines. But um, one thing I thought of that I wanted to, I don't even know a lot about this. I think Ryan McAllister maybe touched on it a, a little mm-hmm. bit with mm-hmm. some of the cosmetic products. Um But is there much money in this? Like, is money at all a motivating factor in kind of keeping this going or? Yeah, that's a great question and a little bit hard to research because of the fact that it's hard to gain these sort of uh, gain this data from hospitals. But it is important to note a few things. Circumcisions are the most commonly performed surgeries in the country, Mm -hmm. which means automatically there is a lot of money coming through this particular surgery. And, um, and as Ryan said in his video, and for anyone who hasn't seen, I'll just kind of uh, recap it now, when he went to talk to the head of the um, OBGYN department at Georgetown University, she said that um, as much as she agrees with him or disagrees with him doesn't matter because she cannot stop this surgery in her hospital because of the financial implications mm. for stopping that, which um, I'm going to go ahead and say this making money off the genitals of infants. I think that is what's happening. People might take that as a very harsh statement to make. And I certainly don't mean to place blame on people who have hardly heard this topic and have never reflected on it. Sure. But um, I think if you have reflected on it on it for a very long time and researched it very deeply and can still somehow justify it, um, it is in a sense, take it or leave it, Uh, making money off the genitals of children. Um, Again, I do not know the exact numbers, but it is the most commonly performed surgery. Um, Ryan also touched on products uh, that are made from the foreskin fibroblasts. Um, So after the foreskin is removed, I think some hospitals do usually uh, use it as waste, but um, hospitals can also sell it to companies and those foreskin fibroblasts are these new cells that can be um, used in um, prosthetics and uh, in skincare. There's one company called Skin Medica that Oprah Winfrey uses uh, Mm. and it helps take away wrinkles and um, it's kind of their selling point how these like new cells help um, rejuvenate your skin. So again, um, it's not it's not the foreskin itself it's the cells from the yep. foreskin but again to the kind of going back to the concept of um, bettering yourself off the genitals of um, a non-assenting child yeah yeah so there is somewhat of an as you know the I'm into various topics like this and <laughs> usually when you look into it there's always some sort of monetary aspect yeah. where there's this industry yeah. this this force that's like just moving and it's like that's yes. sometimes the main driver of a lot of these types yeah. of things and and um going on uh, a kind of similar uh path the tools used the gonco clamp mojin clamp and the plastibel all oh, right are also um these are the three main clamps used during the circumcision surgery and um all of these clamps have their own industry and um uh, there are cases, there are many cases specifically with the Mojin clamp because its mechanism is different from the Plastibel and Gomco. And um, it has the greatest risk of actually uh, cutting off the uh, the part of the head of the penis. Sure. And sure. there have been multiple cases, but 
somehow they are managed to they manage to settle with the parents. So let's not forget that these tools themselves have an industry of themselves, and they certainly have a financial stake in the surgery continuing in this country because it's certainly not taking place in great rates in Britain or Canada or Australia. It's this is kind of its uh, home base yep. for financial operations. Yeah, and that type of stuff it can come across not necess- not very much in this realm, but it can tend to yeah. come across as like conspiratorial or something. But yeah. that's yeah. just the way our world, and especially in this country, uh, yeah, that's the way it works. You know, like yeah, there's industries, and when you look deep, yeah, there's a money motivation, and it's like yeah. oh, it's our bottom line. Like do what you got to yeah. do to cover up the information or make it look a certain way or whatever it is just to keep it going. Um, Absolutely. But um, one of the things that, you know, I don't know if uh, this resonates with you at all, but part of the Mm. thing that I've reflected on besides all the, um, those types of motivations for keeping it going, I've thought about it in terms of like, well, why do we keep doing this just on like a more, on a, on a larger sense, just like, and or why don't people want to know about it? Why isn't it thought about mm. more? Mm-hmm. Um, and part of what I have come to think is that it it would just be so painful for us to really, because I know how painful it is individually to like think about it. And obviously you've already mm-hmm. expressed like some of the distress that it's caused you. And mm-hmm. I just feel like collectively it's such a painful thing and to really realize and feel mm. the, the pain and the trauma we've yeah. caused, yeah. it'd be so raw and palpable to really look at it that it's sort of easier to just like keep it going. And even though there might be cognitive dissonance and, and stuff, it's just like, it's easier to kind of keep it going and let it be in the background than it is to just yeah. like really feel it and yeah. look and look at Absolutely. it. <clears throat> I really think you couldn't have said it better. I think a lot of people just don't want to reflect on it. Um, I think for parents, there's a possibility that they just don't even think about it. Because um, like I said before, they might just have decided it from the get-go because the male in the um, relationship was circumcised and that they don't even think about it. But mm-hmm. I think for doctors, um, there was this really awesome doctor, Dr. Paul Fleiss, who passed away a few years ago. He said that he actually performed multiple circumcisions And then all of a a sudden, one day, he thought to himself, what am I doing? And from that moment on, he stopped performing circumcisions and was an an extreme um, uh, advocate um, for boys remaining intact. Mm. But it takes a really uh, very raw uh, level of reflection to just say, what I did was wrong. And, um, I think if you didn't know before, I don't think people should live in guilt. I think that's a really important thing about this whole, um, the field of, um, genital integrity and autonomy. I don't think people should live in guilt, but I think when one is equipped with information, um, they use it to move forward, not stay stuck in the past. But I think a big part of people Get moving forward is reflecting on the past, and I think that that that's the part that is really really difficult. But I have hope that more and more are doing it. Yeah, that's that's the part that keeps me encouraged in this field because everyone I've talked to, as as um as closed off as they are at first, mm-hmm. by the end of a conversation, there is always like a glimmer of hope of them kind of looking at this in a brand new way. And um, I really believe that that humans have the ability to to move forward if they give it a chance. Yeah. That's what kind of brought me to, to, to feel that and think that is, I uh, don't know if you know the presidential candidate, Andrew Yang, but yes. he, okay, he recently came out about circumcision. Did you mm-hmm, see that? Mm-hmm. And the backlash he got was crazy. And I watched this short little uh, thing on Vice or something. And it was this little Mm -hmm. talk show. And there was um, like four adult people, like two men and two women or something. And and all but one of them 
was just extremely, and maybe they were just being dramatic for the show. I don't really know, but they seemed pretty sincere. And especially this one woman was like, still just like making all these statements about how like sex with uncircumcised men is just bad and like, get that out of here. I don't want to see that or like all of this stuff. And I was just kind of like, wow, what, what is the, I mean, I understand if you think there's mm. medical benefits and, and mm. you still believe that because you haven't looked into yeah. it. But yeah. but the real, like, you know, the vitriol or the emotional just, like, reaction towards it, yeah. that's what yeah. really got me thinking about it and felt like, okay, maybe that's just, like, a defense mechanism from, like, yeah, exactly. if I admit this, then that means that everything I thought about that is, like, completely wrong it yeah. b- breaks down part of my reality and also like yeah. causes me all of this pain, you know. Exactly. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the best ways is to do is to talk about this topic in a non-confrontational way. And like Ryan McAllister has suggested to a lot of the people that he's mentored, um, to just ask just ask people to just think about it, to just like reflect on it. Because yeah. um because like you said, they're going to come in with their own like facts and reality. But when you start asking them questions that slightly chip away at that re- reality, it allows them to come to the conclusion themselves. And thankfully, many, I think nearly, if not all of the people that I've spoken to, it's been really incredible. Um, by the end of a conversation, I can see them question the reality and kind of give room for an alternate reality. So yeah. I think it is absolutely possible. But when I when I see things like that, it does kind of like hurt my heart to think like, wow, do people like um do people even really think about this? But like you said, people do have their own realities and they do feel that their reality is the one that's correct. Um yeah. and uh those are the people that we really can't, you know, aggressively confront. We gotta give them that time to um to reflect on it. Well, yeah, because, I mean, you don't want to go around causing other people pain to try to, you know, stop exactly. infants yeah, from being exactly. in pain. You know, it's just exactly. per- perpetuating exactly. more of the same energy, you know. Um, exactly. Because, yeah, like, you know, it is part of the collective reality and that stuff is what kind of gives us our identity. And it's like part of your identity sort of has to break down to really, like, form mm-hmm. this new version mm-hmm. of reality, you know, and that's a cha- mm-hmm. challenging process. Um, something I wanted to touch on, and I don't know, this is sort of a little sidebar. I don't, it might be a, a little out of the scope, but it does sound like you've studied um, female genital cutting. Uh, so I'm curious, I, w- I watched the American Circumcision and there was one part that threw me off and it was this mm-hmm. woman like sort of supporting female genital cutting, yep. saying it made sex better and all this stuff. And it really sort of just threw me for a loop and there didn't seem to be much resolution on it. And I think it was maybe commenting on the kind of the racism aspect potentially. Mm-hmm. But I was just curious, like, um, I don't have a specific question, but sort of like, yeah. is there any legitimacy m- legitimacy to that? I know it's probably a subjective thing, but like, yeah. I don't know, maybe you can give me some more insight into that and yeah. like some closure on that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I can give you closure. <laughs> I can um I can comment on it. I believe her name is uh Fuambi Sia Amadu. Okay. And um please um I apologize if I've said it incorrectly, sure. but I know exactly who you're talking about and um uh I've watched some of her other interviews and she's definitely a very um like cool, unique woman. Mm -hmm. Uh, She's actually an anthropologist, which is uh, really cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, So her argument had to do with uh, kind of the argument we're making in general, which is she believes that adults, female adults should have the right to undergo female genital cutting, um, either in a social or medical context, because um, as an adult, that is uh, your right. And her next argument was that at first she was very nervous because from her previous sexual experiences before she underwent the um, procedure, she was very happy with them and she was concerned that that would change and it would be bad in the future. But she later found out after the procedure and after she healed that um, sex was actually better. And that was the point that she was, um, she was saying that it wasn't a bad decision to have her um, external, uh, the external portion of the clitoris yeah. removed because yeah. the point that she made and other researchers make is that 
um, most of the clitoris is actually internal, but yeah. there is a small yeah. portion of it is that's external. That was the part that was removed. Um, so I think her overall point is that as an adult, if you want to participate in a particular social custom, you should have the right to do so. Um, and our organization called Muslims Against Child Circumcision make a similar argument as well. Yeah. Um, there are some Jews that make that argument as well. Um, and I'm not sure if this brings anyone closure, but I think in terms of any body modification as an adult, you technically do have the right to do so. And um, I guess some areas that should be worked on is increasing the levels of informed consent of adults in some of these communities where it's kind of like peer pressure to get it done sure. versus them actively choosing to have this done. So there are definite, er definite areas to work on in that regard. But from what I saw in the documentary and from what I saw in her other interviews, that is the overarching point that she was trying to make. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and is was part of maybe what the documentary was also trying to show and obviously you can't speak for them but just like or maybe you can just speak to this general point that i'm about to raise is part of it the idea that like we criticize people in other countries maybe because they're uh have brown skin or because yep. they you know have a different type of culture for doing yeah. these adult because they do they always do them when they're adults in other nope. countries oh they nope. so they do do children yeah. Okay. Yeah, and she and um, from everything that I've gained from her interviews, I don't believe she is a proponent of child or okay. infant female genital cutting because yes, in some of those communities, they do do it either in infancy or childhood, um, or you know, or early teen years. And is it mainly uh, just female in those types of cultures, or nope. is it, it's regular there for is, male as well? <clears throat> yes, most of those cultures have a parallel male genital cutting surgery as well. That's a very that's very important to note as well. And so, do you know much about why that started? Because I know the religious um, origins of like uh, the Western sort of, or I guess the Judaism's not really Western, but in mm -hmm. like countries like Africa, do you know why it started there? Um, so from reading a World Health report, a World Health Organization report um, that came out a few years ago, they said that actually it uh, circumcision was found on ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, the first um, the first representations of it were actually found in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. So I actually think that um, that and again, I uh, please no one take this as 100 uh, percent exactly what happened, but I hypothesize that um, um, this particular type of circumcision could have happened even before um, Abrahamic times, sure. uh, depending on how you believe um, history is, uh, you know, to place back then. But yep. it was found in these in these hieroglyphics. So, um, in terms of African culture, it could have been passed in that regard over the years. And mm -hmm. again, those cultures, the very beautiful and diverse cultures in Africa, are so. Um, like so ancient compared to you know America's culture, Definitely. which is very young in comparison. Uh, so I do not know a hundred percent, you know, right when it started. But right. I did read um, research as well that said that uh, Christians in some of those communities started practicing it when their Muslim counterparts were also doing it for religious reasons. So it could have kind of interwoven itself religiously as well. Sure. Um, so, but I'm not a hundred percent sure of where it started. Uh, in Africa many, many, many years ago. And, and also in, um, in, in in Asia as well. Let's not forget that too. Okay. And uh, maybe you could comment on this quick, just because I thought it was interesting, is that it seems like a common misconception that like uh, Christians believe that um, circumcision is uh, like in the Bible or it, mm -hmm. it, that Christianity promotes it, but that's mm -hmm. not actually true, right? Absolutely. That's 100% um, untrue. Uh, and to anyone out there who thinks I'm trying to tell them all these things, please know that a year and a half ago, I was also 100% unsure. If you said, yeah. is, it a, is it a requirement for Christians to be circumcised? I'd be like, yeah, <laughs> I had no idea. But um, so the, the truth is that um, in the New Testament, there are multiple verses, verses upon verses, where um, both Jesus and Paul, his... Um, his uh, Paul, one of the apostles after Jesus, and Peter, one of his disciples, mm -hmm. 
multiple instances where um, they say that circumcision is not at all a necessity. In fact, when you um, circumcise, you're trying to perform an act um, to gain grace from God, to gain forgiveness from God, when in reality, no act is needed to um, to receive that grace and forgiveness. Like that was the whole point of sending Jesus to the earth. Right. Um, and that was the whole point of the New Testament. You don't have to do anything to your body to um, receive that grace and mercy. Mm. So a very important point. I will be completely honest. I did not know that a year and a half ago. So yeah. I can understand if many Christians in this country are unsure. Yeah. And I, I had also saw that potentially the original um, Jewish circumcision was, I, you'd kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but that was potentially mm-hmm. quite a bit different where it was just like yes. the tip of the foreskin that was being yes. removed. It was called bris milo, coming from the Hebrew word muel, which means to blunt. So it meant that they took just that very, very small portion of skin um, past the gland, so that very tiny bit of skin. And if there was no skin there, they would even just nick it. If Mm. there was no skin there to cut off, they would just nick that skin. Um, But in uh, approximately 100 AD, when the Romans conquered the Jews, and the Jews were kind of integrated into this larger culture there was but there were public baths there were sports with nudity and jewish men um evidence suggests um that jewish men started pulling on their foreskin basically to to match their um roman and greek counterparts and um the the rabbis kind of learned about this eventually and over time they created this second part which is called bris pariah which means pariah means the uncovering and um, this is when they actually, uh, you know, remove the, the complete foreskin. And the final step actually was is bris, bris mitzitsa, which um, actually involves sucking the blood yeah. off of the infant's genitals. It is now only performed by Orthodox Jews. And even um, in New York, you might have heard of those cases where those infants contracted herpes. Yeah from um, the bris mitzitsa taking place, and they actually passed away. Um, but typically, uh, a glass tube is used to kind of uh, get the blood that falls off the child's genitals. But there, it, it's it's now today a three-part process, but in Abrahamic time, it was suggested that it was a one-part process. Yeah. And is there evidence that it was happening to adults at that time? Like that it was practiced when a person was an adult, not to infants? Um, I believe it was always on the eighth day. Oh, okay. And um, a Jewish scholar can 100% correct me, but I believe one of the most important components of welcoming a male child into the Jewish community is that it's performed on the eighth day of life. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, that's that's wild. Um, So they actually intensified it because (laughs) these guys were basically trying was it sports related or something is that right i think just um yeah baths were public at that time sports there was a lot more nudity in sports back then it was just culture was different it was you saw the genitals a lot more often sure um so i think just in order to fit in um there could be various reasons yeah uh, jewish men began doing this so is there any other stuff um, that you can think of or that you've been digging into that we haven't touched on already? I actually think we covered this <laughs> so extensively. I'm so impressed with the vastness of your knowledge and your questions. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, you truly have kind of covered everything. I guess the the one kind of thing to close off on as an encouragement to parents who choose to um, keep their child intact. Um, It's at first, depending on which doctor you go to, it might feel like you're kind of against the odds, but in reality, it is so easy as long as you have the information. There are great resources online. The most important thing to remember when your child is an infant and a toddler is just leave it alone. Clean what is seen is what you'll find online when you are look into it just um 
don't forcibly retract because sometimes that can cause serious enough issues where um, some sort of surgery or some sort of intervention might be needed, which is not necessary at all. Just leave it alone. Just let it do its natural thing. Just clean what is seen with um, water, maybe a mild soap, and um, the body will just naturally take its course as the child gets older. And um, it's going to be as easy as anything else as a female i think yes. females have much more work to do to <laughs> keep ourselves clean and to keep ourselves like away from infection so um whatever anyone might tell you that it's going to be harder i promise you that all the literature out there and um really 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 educated people on this topic will tell you it is as easy as anything else and after your infant is born there is no special care needed because um a circumcised infant will need very 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 specific care because they're going to be experiencing pain and they're going to you're going to have to keep that area very very clean yeah but that is not the case with your intact child yeah the baby boy can poop all over his diaper yeah. and yeah. no big deal absolutely and- not a big deal <laughs> whatsoever i mean it might be a big deal for other reasons because it might be a really messy <laughs> sure. diaper but that that is not traumatizing for anyone. Yeah, I mean, and that and that's what I thought was so interesting was the comparison to uh, to women in the vagina. It's like, oh yeah, it's based, it's set up very similar, you know, mm-hmm. like the moisture and the that. Like we don't consider that any issue for for women. Nobody's talking Absolutely. about how this is some big deal. And women Absolutely. women do get UTIs and yeast infections, and yes, nobody's absolutely ranting about needing to do something about that. So Ex- exactly, <clears throat> um, very true. So uh, I wanted to bring up your quiz because your quiz is very cool, and I'm I'm gonna put Thank like you. various different links in the show notes, and so you okay, can feel awesome. free to uh, any uh, any other things that you want me to include. Let me know, but okay. um. Maybe just mention what your quiz is about and what you're maybe trying to do with it, what the goal okay. of the quiz is. Yeah, I just uh, completed creating an educational tool, which is currently in a Google Forms format. And the purpose of it is for just anyone who has asked a question that I asked a year and a half ago, which is, what do I actually know about circumcision? Um, and then go ahead and take this quiz and very important to hit view my score after you complete the quiz, because only then can you see your score and more importantly, see the feedback for any of the questions you got incorrectly. Um, and the purpose is truly just educational. It's anonymous. So don't think that me or anyone is ever going to know that you took it. Um, so have a clear, um, clear mind there. Sure. And, um, we're also going to be putting it on sites such as Doctors Opposing Circumcision and getting it on other um, genital integrity sites as well so that anyone who goes on that site might just want kind of a quick introduction to what they're going to be getting into. So that can be just a fun way to do it. And um, the next step is also to create a BuzzFeed community post. And once I have that, mm. I will also send that over to you as well because, um, again, BuzzFeed is a great way to non-confrontationally uh, just get some questions out there and just ask people to just think about things that they haven't thought about before. Uh, so that's the next step as yeah, well. Definitely. Yeah. And for parents that do decide to, um, to uh, retain their child's general integrity, if that's one way to put it, um, <laughs> yeah. there is like a community out there of, of, of yeah. people that can, you know, share knowledge and, and support and all of that. Yeah. It seems like so. And I'm very encouraged that the rates of circumcision are declining. And for parents who truly are only looking at the social long-term implications in, I believe, I mean, the rates are already dropping dramatically, but I believe in, in a decade, it's going to be, it's going to start becoming the actual minority, which is really fantastic news and very largely in part to work of people at doctors opposing circumcision Ryan McAllister and Elephant in the Hospital, which is his YouTube video, mm-hmm. which I highly recommend, mm-hmm. and much of Brian Earp's research on genital autonomy, which is also available online, yeah. amongst many others who I have not named. <laughs> Brendan Murata's uh, documentary, documentary American Circumcision, which is on Netflix right now as well. Yeah, yeah, which is great. Um, well, Prerna, I really appreciate you doing this. This, this was awesome. You're so welcome. It was so fantastic talking to you, Jacob. And we will 100% be in touch because I'd love to hear more about what you found because you've also like learned tons. And I guess you've, you've, have you like 
deep dive into this like for a while or um honestly it's, it's only been, been like a month or the last month or two that I've really and then like once I wow, found yeah. out that I so once I so th- what's been kind of going on lately is like this podcast is pretty new as I'm sure you've noticed and um, yeah it's very cool thank Crazy you cool. I appreciate that um and so like I will be into a topic and I'll find a guest and I'll be like, okay, here it goes, nothing. And I email them. And then uh, after I email them, I'm like, okay, I really got to start like actually getting into this stuff now because if they reply, then I'm going to have to, you know, kind of meet up to the, to the thing here. And so then um, once uh, Ryan got back to me and sort of uh, connected us, then I was like, okay, yeah, I got to start reading this stuff and, and so then I watched uh, American Circumcision and mm. and just started kind of poking around more. And honestly, even just like, it's just something I've been thinking about a lot. So beyond mm-hmm. the actual research, I just mm-hmm. like, I'm a thinker. I'm constantly mm. thinking about stuff and I get really out there. And so I was just thinking about it a lot in terms of like, yeah, this whole deal with just like, yeah, yeah, yeah the general feeling about men and like, um, like again, I'm a huge supporter of women of all people, you know, but yeah, of, of women's yeah. rights and feminism. I, but it, it's yeah, I feel I feel like um a lot of men who talk about this like always have to say that. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, it's like um, a disclaimer. I'm like infringing. Yeah. Um, but as a woman who was totally, you know, shocked with FGC and undergrad and continue to um work towards giving um, infants and minors like around the world, the opportunity to not have to experience those uh, surgeries if possible. And particularly in the U.S. where we do have contemporary bioethics principles. Mm. Um, I, I am, I, I feel like I, I, I definitely understand men who like say like, I'm not, you know, this mm-hmm. isn't me trying to be like anti-feminist. I would right, definitely yeah. understand it. Like it is a human rights issue 100% across the board and I think we'll be able to understand cultures that practice FGC more when we take a real close look at what we're doing ourselves so completely understand what you're saying well something else like it it goes right in hand with like something I saw in American circumcision that really sort of uh, Mm -hmm. also like enlightened me in the same way and it goes right along with this sort of just like you know it's not the disclaimer is more like I'm acknowledging that like there's a heavy emphasis on women's rights and just like consciousness about how people <laughs> treat women and everything to where the I think yeah there's this tendency to want to make this disclaimer of like well I'm not saying that's not important but exactly. there's obviously exactly. all of this stuff going yeah. on with men and and one thing that this this man brought up in that documentary was about how it's very common for people to talk about how like women maybe don't understand their bodies very well and how like, you know, maybe some women don't know if they've had orgasms or don't know about the different types of orgasms or literally just don't know their anatomy or the names of things. Exactly. And yeah. He kind of brought up how like with men, it's almost even worse. They don't even understand <clears throat> how like they just think, oh, I just, you know, I just, uh, you know, whatever thrust and something happens, you know, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. they think that's all there is to it. But actually there's mm-hmm. these the different sensations Intri- and yeah, yeah, intricacies and all of this stuff. And I was kind of like, wow, you know, like that is, that is a big deal. It's just like, I don't know, the, the infant circumcision just seems like one manifestation of this issue of surrounding men where it's like we recognize yeah. that men are very aggressive and, um, yeah. you know, violent and various, yeah. various different things about men that we yeah. recognize that can be toxic. Difficult to communicate. Pain. Y- yes, exactly. Closed down from their emotions. Um, yeah. You know, the, just the standard stereotypes about how men don't want to listen to women talk, you know. and Yeah. Uh, all, like minimal. All- communication and like depth of communication yeah all of these different things and i'm not saying all of that comes from circumcision obviously but it it just seems like one very important piece of just an overall thing that maybe we're missing about like if there's all these problems with men i don't think it's just because that's how men are it's obviously something in our culture that's usually probably starting from a very young age the way you know so 
And 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 one more thing I want to say about that. Um, yeah. Another or really teaching uh, girls and women is just to be really proud of their body, however it is, whatever it is, yeah. however it looks. And again, to what I said earlier, as an adult woman, if you want to make um, modifications, that is completely your choice. But I think what we are trying to teach. Um, girls and young women is that just be proud of your body your sexual organs your like every part of your being as as it is um and i think that's something that we kind of have to start teaching boys as well because i have heard from um my male friends that i've spoken to this uh conception in high school of being made fun of um being the outsider uh the you know there's something wrong with their body and um i think kind of the long-term implications of this is letting boys know from the get-go that they are absolutely fantastic that the way they are um let's not forget that circumcised boys didn't have a choice in that either especially if they were circumcised infants so we can't say you know like you're not great the way you are because exactly. they had no choice in that. Yeah. but definitely for intact boys to know that they have been given the chance to have a completely intact body with nerve endings and with organs that um unfortunately those who have been um modified in some way will never have and just to be proud in that fact and not to feel like an outsider but rather to feel like someone who's had the chance to have a completely intact body yeah i mean it 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 was it's been somewhat uh you know uncomfortable maybe to be open about it but at the same time it's sort of like and not that I've really I've never publicly talked about it until (laughs) this but uh even just thinking about talking about I was like oh yeah that might be a little bit weird but it's like I mean if I'm gonna talk to you about this thing I think it's important for me to be open about Mm -hmm. about this issue and it's like Mm -hmm. it was uncomfortable for me growing up and my my parents probably could have talked to me more about it and, and and gotten a little more in depth, like they probably didn't even know like some of the it, reasons about like, exactly why it was important. They basically exactly. yeah, they yeah. just didn't want to hurt me, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, Which is a fantastic reason in and of itself. Exactly. Um so I, I, I don't I never blame parents on either end of it because um unless you spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours into this like many of us <laughs> as researchers in this area will mm-hmm. you won't know all this information so you can't even tell your child what they have or like the the benefits of having a foreskin because you might not even know yourself but yeah. um but as we as we enter this era of of social media and communication um it I do want to get this information to um you know, young males and females out there that having the opportunity to have an intact body is really like an amazing thing. And if you don't have that, it wasn't your choice and it's certainly not your fault, but, um, uh, certainly support and don't make fun of those that, uh, that have, um, intact body. Yeah, definitely. And for any like young men, I don't think there's a lot of young men listening to this, but it's like, I, the big thing I was afraid of was like, Oh, it's never going to like come out. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. It's going to be like this forever. And like, I remember trying to get it to come out as a kid because I was like afraid that it, you know, I was going to like look different forever. And, um, but I will say again that that was a small price to pay in the end. And I, and I am very grateful that, you know, that my parents did decide to not, um, do that. Um, absolutely. But, and I hope it becomes more and I, and it's becoming more common. I hope it continues to be more common that adult males can look back and think like, yeah, I'm really, really glad that I have all of my organs and same with females as well. Yeah. And I think, you know, like you mentioned with the social media and communication, it brought up to me this uh, concept of like, well, part of the reason maybe my parents didn't talk to me about it more was because, Mm -hmm. um, you know, talking about that stuff, even with parents and and children is like not seem seemingly not done a lot and hopefully it's getting, getting better, but it's like you learn most of that in some a shitty sex ed class, you know, where (laughs) which will definitely not tell you like the the whole story in any case. Yeah, where it's like, you know, it is if and I'm not a parent, so I can't really say too much about this, but Mm -hmm. hopefully parents are being able to have more open conversations. And you know, if if the dad does look different than the son, then maybe they can just have a conversation about that. And it's not a big deal, you know. Exactly. And for parents who 
um, are in that situation, there are really cool resources online um, on the site, Your Whole Baby, about how to talk to your child about that as they get older, about the difference nice. between dad and the son and how most kids are completely fine with that. Yeah. If not all children. There's no scientific study that's been done on this, but. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, I think most kids, if they have an open, honest conversation with their parent, they're they're going to be fine with it. So exactly. Well, again, I really appreciate it. And like, if in the future there's more developments, or you're doing mm-hmm. more stuff, or once <laughs> once you get something, you know, like uh, onto some sites or whatever, yeah. any yeah. any things, I would love to talk to you again. It was just a pleasure, like talking in general. So it was really, really great talking to you, Jacob, and like. I'm just, I'm like kind of pumped up with everything that you've said and all of your (laughs) insights. So thank you so much for all of the kind of energy you brought to this as well. And it was a pleasure talking to you and um, your podcast is super cool. Thank you. You have been listening to Awake, Aware, Alive. Please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes preferably five stars also go visit us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Jacob Gossel and become our patron and get cool extra stuff <laughs>